I could not be more excited to introduce this conversation. Precious plastic, reimagining plastic waste. Plastic waste and recycling the massive waste that we have all over our globe is always top of mind. But when Jaden Smith joined our board over three years ago and became an instrumental executive officer and integral part of the growing of impact, it became one of our most important key missions. Jaden has been a proponent of reuse and recreate every bit of plastic that is polluting not only our oceans, but our lands. Last year, having met activist and founder of Precious Plastic, Jaden was determined to have Dave Hackens be part of this year's Emma Impact Summit. Dave has created a forum to teach a multitude of ideas, from educating people on how to become a recycling hero, to techniques to turn waste into new objects, from furniture, to decor, to art pieces and jewelry. Precious Plastic has innovative plastic shredders that enable anyone to recycle plastic. Please welcome Jaden Smith and Dave Hackens. How are you guys doing today? So this is Dave Hackens. Can we get a round of applause for that amazing video? Hey. <laughs> so Dave, yes. tell us about yourself. What's your background? How did you get involved with Precious Plastic? What made you want to start this company? Okay, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Dave from the Netherlands. I uh, studied industrial design and um, at some point was just looking at uh, problems in the world. Um, plastic was a big problem. Um, also when I started traveling around, I saw like a lot of plastic waste everywhere. So I was thinking, okay, maybe uh, you know, with my design skills do something about that. Uh, so I started uh, yeah, diving into the problem of plastic. And um, well, so basically it was one of those things that you see plastic waste around you everywhere, but you can't really do anything with it. And a lot of people want to do something with it, but they just don't have the tools to do it. So I figured maybe, maybe I should build those tools, those machines that you can actually take the plastic, shred it, mold it into something new. And that's kind of how it started. So when did you get started and how did you assemble your team for Precious Plastic? How did you find other like-minded people that also cared about the environment and about recycling? And where and when did you get started? Mm, so it was about uh, six years ago now. started as my graduation project, actually, so very small. And I just built a set of machines myself to see if it's even possible. Like, can you actually recycle plastic on a small scale? Kind of worked. But the machines were still a bit shitty because I just made them watching YouTube videos trying to build machines. Um, so then I knew, okay, I need to make a new version of this whole project. So I invited like this old machine builder, I think he was in his 50s or something, to help to make really steady machines. Um, so then we had good machines, but then we're like, wow, we also need to increase more like our online infrastructure, like how people can connect with each other, can they sell the items they made, stuff like that. So we made a new version, uh, which was way more yeah, software oriented. So we're always sort of improving the, the project and the team grows a bit more every time, I would say. Wow, wow, that's amazing. Plastic is kind of like the poster child for environmental threats right now. What's your overall attitude towards plastic in the culture? Mm, well, so I've been working with plastic now for six years. I'm not sure if I really like it. <laughs> um, I mean, but it, it's one of those things you can't really uh, deny it either. I mean, it's there, we produced it, we made it, took us a lot of effort to get it, to extract it from oil. So I feel like it's, it's a waste if we don't use it. Um, so I would be very much pro-recycle everything we made so far, but stop producing new plastic, because in a way there's already enough material out there, it's made to be recycled, so we could just do that. Um, so, um, but I think ultimately you want to go towards a world where maybe plastic is not included. Uh, or more bio-based uh, degradable materials. But I think we're just not there yet, and it takes time to get there. It means a lot of innovation, new technologies. Um, so I think there's always this transition phase also of, of using the materials you have uh, towards a more yeah, sustainable future. That sounds cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've created an entire, you know, online community of people who can create um, recycled plastic products just 
you know, kind of in their local senses and post it up onto the internet and go on preciousplastic.com and share it with everyone else, sell it on the bazaar, you know, create places for people like me to go onto the bazaar and buy, uh, you know, precious plastic products. Do you think that, you know, on an industrial level that bigger companies can and will start using mostly consumer, you know, trash and recycle that to make new products? Do you think that that can happen on that industrial level? And if so, do you think that would be good for the world? Mm, yeah, so I think that that can well easily happen for sure because you can recycle the plastic, but um, the processes needs to be a bit more flexible because sometimes the plastic is a bit mixed or sometimes it's a bit dirty. So that's why the industry doesn't really use recycled plastic. It's just easier to get new. But I think we're heading towards there. Uh, and I think one of the things where precious plastic is also very much adapted. Um, so because we basically share everything we do open source online, so everyone can just start. So we see where people start a lot. And it's also very often in remote areas where there is just no infrastructure, no companies that take on the plastic. But it is sort of flowing in from, from the ocean or you know, in Coli's they are selling their bottles but not taking care of the bottles. Um, so in these very remote areas, you also see much more people yeah, wanting to recycle plastic but just don't have the infrastructure. But I do think just so those two both need to exist. You need to have a big industry that works on it, but you also need to be in every corner of the world to take care of the trash. 100%. What is the most popular object that you've made at the Precious Plastic Workspace? <laughs> um, and how many objects do you think you've made, like different things over the past six years? Um, well, so we are a bit more focused on making machines and infrastructure. And it's more the community that makes the, the, the objects. So some stuff that has been around here as well. Uh, it's made by people from around the world, a guy in Thailand, Ukraine, Australia. Um, so it really depends where you are in the world. So for instance, people in Africa, they make more basic stuff, like a bowl or like a beam to build something. In the Western world, they like to go more for an iPhone case or 3D printer filament, stuff like that. Um, so, so it really depends where in the world you are, what the people like to make, or what makes sense to make even. So I know that you've made a lot of different creative things in your um, precious plastic workspace with your team. Um, what's the most fun or what's the most difficult thing that you guys have made in that workspace? Mm, so recently we made a table for Jaden Smith. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was actually quite a challenge. Yeah. Uh, the, the freshest, biggest challenge. Um, but I think we always try to, to come up with a new thing or try out like how can we make something bigger or something thinner or something more lightweight or something more flexible. So we always try to learn and educate ourselves more about plastic. And I think that's actually one of the big things about this project is, is gaining information about plastic because if you want to make something with wood, you buy a hammer and a saw and you just make something. If you want to make something with metal, you get a grinder, welding machine and you start. But plastic, the material is everywhere around us, but we don't really know what to do with it. We don't have the, the tools and the knowledge to even understand, like, are there different types of plastic, different melting temperatures, how does it behave when you melt it? And I think that's what we like to do, to just try it out, figure it out, and share that information online. So you said that the table that you built for me was one of the hardest things that you've done. Why was it so difficult? Uh, particularly there, I would say, it was making something very, very big, um, and also something that really feels valuable. So we see plastic often as this cheap disposable material, whereas of all the materials in the world is the one that lasts super long. I mean, the wood would rot away, metal rusts away, but plastic stays forever. But we use it to make this cheap disposable stuff. So um, our project is also called Precious Plastic because we see it as a precious material. So um, that's always one of the things we try to do, like how can we actually make plastic more precious? And is it if you make it heavier? Is it if you... Uh, inc uh, include more details in there, if you mix colors better. So just playing with those variables on how to make it more valuable. Um, and I think that was a big part of the table as well. We wouldn't really wanted to make this piece of rock almost like a piece of marble. Uh, that was challenging. So the table that I asked them to make for me, it's actually 12 feet long. Um, and it's completely made out of recycled plastic. It's a conference table so I can have meetings about sustainability and people can meet with me on a recycled plastic table so that they know we're serious about it. Um, and how much does it weigh? I think around uh, 300 kilo. We haven't really measured it. Yeah. And it's made from uh, old CD cases and fridges, uh, so that kind of and cups. 
So we're actually working on a video so that you guys can see the entire process of what they went through to make it all the way to the delivery. Um, so we're really excited to show you guys that. Um, another question I have for you is, how are you funded? What's the business model and how do you scale? How much does it cost to make these machines? Uh, so that part of life I haven't really figured out, I would say. <laughs> um, so we, we have all these workspaces around the world from people that set up a little plastic recycling station, get plastic and sell it. And we really like it if they have business models. So we really try to help them get started, provide business models and templates so they can really grow their own business in it and recycle day in, day out and do it financially sustainable so they can keep doing it. We, like as Fresh Plastic Headquarters, that try to develop stuff. Um, we don't sell anything. Um, we don't produce anything. We only really learn stuff and we share it open source online for free. So we rely on people donating money, uh, people supporting it more like monthly basis. Uh, I, every now and then we win an award, stuff like that. I would say it's always a bit hustling. Um, but uh, so far, so good. I mean, the upside is that because we give a lot to people, they also give a lot back. So they, they're always happy to help and share their knowledge, their expertise, or give materials and stuff like that. That's so amazing, honestly. So I don't know if you guys saw, but Dave actually donated a bunch of precious plastic pieces to us out here in the lobby. So when you walk out and you see on the table of the register, there is so many different precious plastic pieces that have come from all over the world, and each one of those different items are all made out of trash and they look so beautiful. So talk to me about where those all came from. You said those all came from different people around the world that work with your online community. Uh, yeah, so we, um, we have one guy who's actually very active in Thailand. He started like really in the first version when the machines were still very shitty. Uh, he made them. <laughs> but it's cool because every time we, you see him growing as well. So if you buy some products from him, then suddenly he makes a bigger machine or a new machine. So they sort of develop with us in the project. Uh, we also, I think, have some baskets from a guy in Ukraine. And he actually has this technique of making a basket with his hand. And I don't even know, I know how he does it, but I wouldn't be able to do it myself. And I think that's also where it gets excited, that we share something and people take it and they improve it and they make it better. So this whole community sort of figures out together how to work with plastic. That's amazing. That's so awesome that you have an open source model in that type of way where people can just learn from each other. Hmm. Do you feel like that really benefits you guys when you're just trying to create new ideas, bouncing things around with people across the world? Well, I think it was very much in the beginning as well. So, okay, you had this big plastic problem, it's everywhere in the world, and you have machines to recycle. Does it make sense if I would visit every place in the world and set up a machine? It's gonna take me forever, it's kind of inefficient. So it kind of made sense to do it open source because then you put the information online and it's just like instantly everywhere. So in a way, I think it's just a much more scalable solution as well um, because the information is just there and everyone, if, if we release an update, everyone gets better. So it feels way more efficient than really having to visit every place. That's awesome. So when you're building things out of recycled plastic um, and you're just trying things out, do they ever break? Do you have you know, trial and error where sometimes things may... Yeah, they, a lot. And I think that's kind of the, the thing what we do. So I would say of all the things we do, 99% goes wrong, like a lot. <laughs> Before we have a shredder machine, we make to make like 20 shredders that don't work. But that's kind of also what, what we do as the Precious Plastic Headquarters. So to make all these mistakes, do all the stupid stuff, try it all out, and then share the best one online. Because in that way, not everyone in the world has to make the same mistakes. So if we just do that for them. Uh, and sometimes it's a bit frustrating, but it's always a bit, it's, the motivation is always like, we make this mistake, so no one else has to do it. So if we keep on going and share the solution, then everyone has that. I think that's always sort of the thing that keeps us going. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so how many countries are you in and how do you export to developing nations where plastic, is, plastic waste is unimaginable? And what have you learned going into these different places? Um, yeah, so uh, one of the downsides we have, because it's open source, is that it's hard to really track where it goes, because you only know if someone started if they share something back. Um, but we, we have like this map online where you can see all the workspaces. I think now it's about 300 around the world, and roughly like a new one every week. Um, 
And it, it, yeah, it's kind of fun for us to also see how they adapted because it's so different where you are in the world. And it, I've been traveling quite a lot myself as well to just understand how people work in, in the middle of Kenya or in, in Chile or in, uh, I don't know, in Southeast Asia. And it is always interesting if you meet that local waste picker there in the middle of nowhere that he kind of heard about pressure plastic. And I don't know, I'm always kind of surprised by that, that it does reach the people that kind of could actually set up a workspace like that. Um, so I don't know, I think the internet just helps to spread it all around. That's amazing. That's amazing. So <clears throat> for my last question, where do you see precious plastic in three years? Mm, so I never really know. Mm -hmm. um, because we always, so now we're working on a new version. We made a few bigger machines. Um, that can also recycle more plastic in bulk amounts, better business models behind it, more product examples, like a lot of new stuff. And we're going to release that in October this year. So that's always very exciting, version 4. Um, but then we never really know how people use it, how they take it, what we could improve after that. So usually we put it online, we take a holiday, <laughs> um, see what happens, how people use it, and then maybe build a new version. Um, but I think overall, how, we, how I would see it more in the long run is a bit like with metal. I really like metal recycling um, because it's very efficient. Like 99% of the metal gets recycled. And in every village around the world, you have a place where you can bring your old metal and get some money in return. And maybe if you wouldn't even bring it yourself, there's a guy picking it up or homeless people picking up aluminum cans because it's worth something. And I think that should just be with plastic as well, that you have this basic infrastructure in society that just takes care of the plastic. It's being processed locally. And uh, in that way, it just creates this value. So, and I think that's, we're getting there, or we're we working towards it, but I have no clue how long it takes. Wow, Dave Hackett, <laughs> you're amazing. I just want to say thank you, your icon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Hackett. <laughs>